Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation called Jet Fire Modeling – Hydrocarbons and Hydrogen. My name is Jan Stenne and I work with Consequent Modeling at DNV. This work has been a collaboration with my DNV colleagues David Worthington, Yong Fu Xu and Nadia Oki, as well as Derek Miller at Air Products. The outline of my presentation looks like this. First, we'll give a bit of background for this work before introducing the Jet Fire Model for hydrogen and syngas as developed by Derek Miller. We'll look at some of the details of this model, look at some of the extensions made to the model by DNV, and we'll compare model predictions with experimental data. We will also see how this new Miller model for jet fires compares to other established models. And we will finish off with some conclusions and a summary. Now the context and motivation for this work um, is that while we have many semi-empirical jet fire models that are widely used in the industry, they are typically based on hydrocarbon data. That means that practitioners have been asking themselves whether these models are suitable to predict radiation for jet fires from low luminosity flames like hydrogen. Derek Miller at Air Products looked into this in detail and published a paper in 2015 with his colleagues where they looked at some of the existing models for predicting jet fire radiation and compared predictions with a large amount of experimental data. And their conclusion was that by and large, these existing models were not fit for purpose for low luminosity flames. Uh, <clears throat> further to this work, uh, Derek Miller in 2017 presented a paper with a new jet fire model specifically tailored to handle releases uh, that results in jet fires for hydrogen and syngas, so low luminosity flames. So together with this new model and further hydrogen data becoming available for jet fires, um, we have decided that it's been time to update our jet fire modeling in fast and Safeti here at DNV, so to better predict radiation and flame shapes for low luminosity flames. One of the things that makes it difficult to model jet fires is that jet fires can come in many different ways. So we have a range of jet fires um, and the characteristics will vary depending on things like the fuel composition, the fluid phase, the release direction, wind conditions. It may be a controlled release that causes a jet flare or it can be an accidental release. And of course, the release could happen in an unconfined or within a confined area. So a range of different jet fire scenarios uh, are possible and should be considered when assessing the hazards from such fires. To model jet fires, there are different categories of models that can be used. On one end of the scale, you have complex computational fluid dynamics based models that are computationally expensive and typically complex to implement. On the other end of the scale, you have correlation-based models, so-called semi-empirical models that are, that are typically derived from experimental data. It's these semi-empirical models that we are studying in this presentation. One of those models is referred to as the cone model because the jet fire flame is represented by a truncated cone, as can be seen in this figure. This kind of model was introduced by Chamberlain in 1987 for vertical or inclined vapor jet fires. Modifications to that model were later made to account for liquid and two-phase jet fires by Cook et al. in 1990. And further modifications were made by Johnson in 1994 to account for horizontal jet fires. Now, because the uh, existing jet fire models based on hydrocarbon data was found not to be satisfactory to predict jet fire radiation from low luminosity flames like hydrogen and syngas, Derek Miller presented a new jet fire model for these type of jet fires. Uh, we'll hear after refer to this model as the Miller model. It was published in 2017, and as mentioned, it applies to hydrogen and syngas, um, and in general to low luminosity gases. The model is applicable to vapor jet fires, and it allows for horizontal, inclined and vertical releases. The model is based on the Chamberlain and Johnson models, but has been extended in, in various ways, which we will come back to. 
um, and it was derived by looking at a large amount of experimental data for hydrogen and hydrogen mixture releases. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the new Miller model. And first we will look at the flame shape. Now here we see a picture of a horizontal jet fire. This is actually from an Air Products uh, DNV experiment carried out in 2009. It's a large horizontal hydrogen jet fire with a flame length of almost 50 meters. And the Miller model actually assumes that you have the flame represented by two line segments. So this is a line model, not the surface model. Okay. Now the key thing here is that the flame shape is represented by the two segments where the first one is what we call the momentum dominated part of the jet flame. So that's from the release point uh, and to a certain distance where there's a very high momentum and that is what dominates the direction of the flame. Now the second line segment, you can see here in green, is actually what we call the buoyancy or the wind dominated part of the flame. And so here we can see due to buoyancy, the hydrogen jet flame actually lifts upwards. And so you have a certain angle here. And hence the jet fire here is represented by the Miller model as two line segments uh, at an angle. One is the momentum dominated segment and the other is the buoyancy wind dominated segment. For a vertical jet fire, the Miller model principles for flame shape is very similar as to the ones just seen for a horizontal jet fire. This particular picture here is taken from the Willoughby paper from 2011. Uh, it comes from an HSL test of vertical hydrogen jet fire. So the Miller model will again have a momentum dominated part of the flame, which is the vertical part you can see indicated by the blue arrow here. And then the impact of the wind further away from the release point becomes important. So the flame tilts and we have this buoyancy wind dominated part of the flame shape. Next, we move on to talk about how the Miller model predicts the radiation from the jet flame. The Miller model is what we call a multi-point source model. And if you look at the figure here, you can see that you have a set of evenly distributed points along the center line of the flame, each of these points emitting radiation. Each point don't emit the same amount of radiation. Rather, we assume that there is a peak radiation happening at around two thirds of the length of the flame. The minimum radiation will happen at the two ends of the flame, the beginning of the flame, and at the very end of the flame. And in between, you have a linearly increasing and decreasing distribution for the radiation for each of these points. Since uh, Miller published his model in 2017, um, we have made some updates uh, here at DNV to his model. And this work has actually been done in collaboration and discussion with, with Derek Miller. And I wanted here to take this opportunity to mention some of the uh, key updates that we have made. First of all, we made some updates to the liftoff distance in the model. So the distance between the release point and the start of the actual flame. We've also taken into account crosswind for horizontal and inclined releases. Um, this wasn't taken into account in Miller's original formulation. And we have adopted uh, Johnson's logic from his 1994 paper to take into account crosswind uh, effects for the buoyancy part or the wind part of the jet flame. We're also using a continuous distribution for the radiation intensity along the flame center line rather than a set of 30 degree points, allowing us to get a higher resolution for the calculated radiation. There's a modification to the tilt angle for vertical releases, which has got to do with the consistency in the solution algorithm. And we've also introduced planar observer. The original formulation in, in the 2017 paper by Miller looks only at point observers, um, but sometimes it makes sense to look at a planar observer, which calculates radiation coming onto a plane. If you have, for example, a wall with a fixed orientation surface in space. In summary though, most of these uh, extensions have 
only caused minor result differences for most cases uh, compared to Miller's original 2017 formulation, which we will see shortly. We have now come to the part of the presentation where we will compare predictions by the Miller model in terms of radiation with experimentally observed radiation levels for jet fires. We have here included a set of 10 experiments as listed in the tables below. There is a variation in the fuel used for these jet fires, hydrogen, syngas, natural gas, and hydrogen natural gas mixtures. There's also a variation in the scale of these jet fires, ranging from really small scale jet fires to large jet flames. We also have included experiments here that have vertical releases as well as horizontal releases. Here we see a comparison of the Miller model as presented in the 2017 paper with the updated Miller model uh, present in Fast and Safeti. The dark blue squares is the updated Miller model and the yellow circles is the original Miller model. We compare results here against experimental data for a wide range of experiments that has included hydrogen, hydrogen nitrogen mixtures, hydrogen CO2 mixtures, and there's vertical releases and horizontal releases. Hydrocarbons are excluded here because that's outside the scope of the Miller model. Any points that lay exactly on this line 1.0 means that the model predictions matches the experiment exactly. Any points below 1.0 means that the model underpredicts the radiation, and points above 1.0 means that the model overpredicts the radiation level. Comparing the yellow circles and the dark blue squares, we can see that overall, there is very little difference in the model predictions between the original and updated Miller model. However, there seems to be slightly better agreement with the updated Miller model, and in particular, it is less under predictions in the updated model. So the DNV Miller version is slightly more conservative. In this plot, we're comparing the performance of the updated uh, Miller model with the Johnson model for horizontal jet fires. We are here considering low luminosity jet fires, so it's hydrogen, hydrogen nitrogen mixture, and hydrogen CO2 mixtures. If we first look at the yellow circles, which are the predictions from the Johnson model versus the experimental data, we here see that there is a significant and consistent underprediction by the Johnson model in radiation levels throughout the range of radiations seen. So that's obviously a concern because in your hazard assessment, you don't want to underestimate the radiation. Now with the updated Miller model, however, we see much better performance and we see that the predicted radiation is close to the experimental data, sometimes slight over predictions, sometimes slight under predictions, but generally we see that throughout the range of validation values, it's a good fit with the, what was measured experimentally. So a clear improvement here from the updated Miller model uh, versus uh, the Johnson model that is uh, often used for horizontal jet fires. Moving on from horizontal jet fires to vertical jet fires, again, focusing on hydrogen and hydrogen mixtures with nitrogen and CO2, we here compare the updated Miller model with the Chamberlain model. There's much more scatter in the data seen here in general than there was for horizontal releases. But again, we can see that the updated Miller model tends to give uh, better predictions than the um, Chamberlain model throughout the range uh, of experimental data seen. So again, for these low luminosity gases, the Miller model provides an improvement compared to um, the Chamberlain model, which is often used for vertical jet fires. In the previous plots, we have seen how the Miller model predicts radiation compared to experiments for jet fires for low luminosity flames. Now we're looking at the Miller model predictions for hydrocarbon jet fires. So that's outside the scope of the Miller model, but nevertheless, we wanted to assess its performance for those kinds of jet fires. 
We compare the Miller predictions with predictions from the cone models of Johnson and Chamberlain. So the cone model predictions are seen by looking at the yellow circles, while the dark blue squares is predictions by the Miller model. In general, we can see that it's quite a bit of scattering data with the cone model having some outliers for low values of radiation here, and also some over predictions can be seen for the Miller model here. Overall, the performance is adequate by both the cone models and the Miller models, perhaps with slightly better match by the cone model. Now, this is not surprising given the fact that the Miller model was not developed for hydrocarbon jet fire flames. Having compared model predictions with experimental data, we are now in a position to make some recommendations for the choice of jet fire model. When you're choosing between the cone models of Chamberlain, Cook and Johnson and the new Miller model. For vapor jet fires, the recommendation is to use the Miller model when you're dealing with low luminosity gases. In other cases, we suggest using the Johnson model for horizontal releases. Otherwise, use the Chamberlain model. For two-phase and liquid jet fires, the recommendation is to always use the Cook model. We're coming towards the end of the presentation today, and I just wanted to mention some limitations and, and further work. Now, these semi-empirical models are created on the basis of experimental data, so they are fitted to the data. So there is always the um, limitation here that when we get outside of the range of, of the data used to develop the model, there is bigger uncertainty on how the model will perform. Um, for the vertical jet fires, we have seen quite a lot of scattering in the data when you compare model predictions with experiments, which we would like to uh, have a better understanding of and see if any improvements are possible in that regard. We're also investigating the importance of the liftoff distance for these low luminosity jet fires, and we're looking at the radiation intensity distribution along the flame center line to see whether any improvements can be made there. Now, we're also interested in uh, extending this investigation beyond just vapor jet fires, in particular looking at two-phase hydrogen jet fires is of interest. Allow me to recap the main points from this presentation. We have presented a new Miller jet fire model, which is applicable to low luminosity gases. We've seen that in the Miller model, the flame shape is presented as two line segments, one momentum segment close to the release point and one buoyancy wind segment further away from the release point. The radiation in the Miller model is calculated on the basis of a multipoint source model. We've compared the model prediction from the Miller model and other cone models with their experimental data. And the main takeaway is that the recommendation is to use the new Miller model for low luminosity gases like hydrogen and syngas. If you're interested in further details of this work, we refer to the accompanying paper, which has references in it. And we also refer to the fast affected jet fire theory, theory document. The new Miller model will be part of the upcoming fast and affected release version 8.6 that is scheduled for later this year. Before wrapping up, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Air Products for uh, sharing their experimental jet fire data with us uh, that has uh, helped us in this work. And in particular, Derek Miller um, has been very helpful and we've had several discussions with him in uh, regards to the new Miller model. That's all. Thank you very much for listening.